argued for nine years that it is essential for the media in this country to call the crazy shit Trump says crazy shit all the time. I have argued for five years that Joe Biden should call the crazy shit Trump says crazy shit. And it's like I've been talking to the wind. And then yesterday afternoon, this is CNN senior White House correspondent MJ Lee. And this is actually off CNN's air. And this is something. We are told that the thrust of the president's direction was to significantly ramp up the campaign's efforts to highlight the crazy shit that Trump says uh, in public. I'm not alone. I feel like I'm no longer taking crazy shit pills. Did we all of a sudden have a breakthrough? Did somebody just throw a switch somewhere? I want CNN to talk like that. I want Biden's surrogates to talk like that. I want the president to go and talk like that. I want to hear the phrase, the crazy shit that Trump says. I want to hear it said by Joe Biden. I want to hear it said in the State of the Union. And I want him to say it right after, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to have it be broadcast a hundred times that night on a hundred different channels. And I want to see the right wing pundits stage phony strokes and umbrage at his locker room talk because he says it. And I want it played again and again and again for the rest of the campaign, primarily because it's the truth. And by the way, don't think that was some sort of accident. She didn't goof up. This is MJ Lee's story for CNN's website, which went live about 45 minutes before she said that on their air yesterday. Quote, Biden personally directed his senior campaign aides in recent days to focus more aggressively on Trump's inflammatory comments, according to two sources familiar with the president's edict. The thrust of Biden's direction delivered to his senior most staff was to significantly ramp up the campaign's efforts to highlight the, quote, crazy S asterisk asterisk T that Trump says in public, according to those sources, unquote. You bet your A asterisk asterisk. Quite seriously, the idea that the easiest way to beat Trump is to quote Trump and make people hear it. And the easiest way to make people hear it, to break through the numb to it all white noise, permitting Trump to survive this long as a public figure, is to get angry about it. To get angry enough for the CNN White House correspondent to say the crazy shit that Trump says live from the White House lawn in the middle of the day. Today, the crazy shit that Trump says. Tomorrow, the F word. But it's more than just shock value. This is the way Biden talks. It clearly is the way Trump talks. And oh, by the way, it is the way all of Washington talks. It is the way all of America talks. And don't get me wrong, Biden reaching the same conclusion about talking like that in public my conclusion that's not him listening to me does it listen to me it's coincidental it's being done because it's right and as a parenthetical as television news as television has receded into the background i have also long argued that the next mainstream newscast that actually would grow an audience would be one which chose to freely use your more popular Anglo-Saxon expletives. Craig Ferguson got close a decade ago. He used to say them to his live audience at his CBS talk show and then bleep them for TV. Maybe that would be a good interim step. I pitched a show like this to several places seven, eight years ago. But bluntly, if MJ Lee promised to accurately quote her sources, swearing like stevedores, I would watch her do a newscast every day on CNN. Hell, if Wolf Blitzer does it, I'll watch for two hours every day. And I haven't watched anything on CNN since I left there in October 2002. It makes me feel like singing for joy 
Wait. Oh, Nancy. Someday, watching CNN, I will feel a glow just thinking of you and the crazy shit Trump says tonight. Thank you, Nancy Faust. A minute or two ago, I posited that this really might have had been a breakthrough or it was a watershed moment about Trump and not just because of CN effing N. At almost the exact moment that was happening on the White House lawn, Nikki Haley went even roguer than previously. Despite being a de facto incumbent, Donald Trump lost 49% of the vote in Iowa. In New Hampshire, Trump lost 46% of the vote. That's not good. We're talking about almost half of our voters. What does it say about an incumbent who's losing nearly half of his party? It spells disaster in November. Man, do I hate it when I agree with Nikki Haley or CNN. Or both of them on the same day. I don't know what got into her. I still don't trust her. I still don't think she's that bright. But that gave me a bigger smile than when Jonathan Turley left me with the permanent image while criticizing Judge Engeron's fine against Trump. Quote, he ordered everything short of throwing Trump into a wood chipper. Well, John, we can always hope. Many of the same politicians who now publicly embrace Trump privately dread him they know what a disaster he's been and will continue to be for our party they're just too afraid to say it out loud well i'm not afraid to say the hard truths out loud i feel no need to kiss the ring again agreeing with cnn and nikki haley on the same day i begin to question myself And then Trump does something to end my questioning. His Neanderthalian spokesperson, Stephen Chung, replied to Haley by writing, she's going to drop down to kiss ass when she quits like she always does. If Nikki Haley goes to a campaign event today and comes back with an F-bomb against Trump, I'll donate the max to her campaign. Holy cow, if you ever forget that we're not just fighting Trump on his insanity, dictatorship, fascism, racism, greed, white supremacy, anti-Semitism, barbarism, irresponsibility, future of the planet, that it's not just that, but we're also fighting something far more existential, that he and his gang are thugs and bullies and lowlifes and subhuman scumbags, that we are fighting for human beings, however mediocre we are, against humanoids. If we ever forget that, Trump makes sure that worms like Stephen Chung remind us. The former fighter guy. And remember, Stephen Chung, symptoms of CTE can appear prior to mortality. And Trump also provides a daily reminder that the other people on his side are even worse than his spokesmen are. The supposed FBI whistleblower in the Hunter Biden case, the man who is at the center of the James Comer, Jim Jordan, Chuck Grassley, Donald Trump smear job against Hunter Biden and his father, the one they arrested last week for lying to the FBI, Alexander Smirnoff. His detention memo came out yesterday. It includes one line of interest, quote, During his custodial interview on February 14th, Smirnov admitted that officials associated with Russian intelligence were involved in passing a story about Business Person One. Yeah, you know who Business Person One is, right? His first name is Hunter. Now, a reminder, this phrase... Officials associated with Russian intelligence, that now applies to basically two-fifths of the Republican Party and anybody directly connected to Trump. Plus, they did just arrest this guy Smirnoff for lying to the FBI. Still, he also reported 
who contacts with a Russian official that Smirnov claimed was the son of a former high-ranking Russian official, and he claimed he was the head of an assassination unit, and he claimed he was a Russian intel guy. And Smirnov also reported contact with another guy he says is a Russian intel guy. There was a lot of vague talk about compromat and, and phone calls involving U.S. people that the Russian agencies have. Mike Johnson. Again, that could be any Republican on the House Oversight Committee, so don't read too much into it yet. Read a lot into this, though. The same authoritarian Republicans behind Project 2025 and making all the federal employees pledge personal allegiance to Trump and invoking the Insurrection Act on the day of his second inauguration and using the military against peaceful protesters, they have a second set of objectives. Christo-fascism. Politico got hold of a mess of documents from the Center for Renewing America, this psycho Russell Votes company. They are filled with plans to restrict divorce, to stop funding anything that enables single motherhood, to repeal all LGBTQ rights, to force the FDA to revoke approval of abortion drugs, to put Planned Parenthood out of business, to end all school sex education, to allow Christians to opt out of basically any law they can make up a religious objection to, and to allow into this country only immigrants who have accepted the Bible. This is what they want. This is the serious crazy shit, Trump says. And if you think it's just stuff he says, you may have missed this from Alabama last Friday, where the Supreme Court there ruled that embryos frozen for in vitro fertilization are people. Which not only essentially destroys in vitro fertilization in the state of Alabama, but if the embryos are destroyed, the Supreme Court there is saying that somebody will be liable to be prosecuted under an act called wrongful death of a minor. This is where we are going. This is why what was said on CNN yesterday is so important. This is where Trump and the Christo-fascists are taking us and taking us as hostages. On a happier note, a programming announcement. Two weeks from now, approximately, Thursday night, March 7th, iHeart and I will be doing a Countdown with Keith Olbermann live State of the Union podcast special on YouTube right after, yeah, the State of the Union. President Biden talks, he stops, we go live on YouTube on camera with the podcast. Tomorrow's podcast today, around 10 Eastern, I think. Still working out the details, but me on camera, I'll shave and take viewer questions at the end of it too. Not going to kid you, the premise of this is we want to try out live video capability here for key nights during the rest of the campaign. So we'll start 10 p.m. Thursday night, March 7th, the Countdown with Keith Alderman live State of the Union podcast special on YouTube. A nice catchy name for it, too. And it will be viewable again later on YouTube, and the regular podcast will appear in the regular places wherever you podcast. But we'll change it up a little bit. We'll do it live! And also of interest here, time to salute the man who broke the color barrier in Major League Baseball. Jackie Robinson? No, not him. The tragedy of William Edward White of the 1879 Providence team. That's next. This is Countdown. This is Countdown with Keith Olbermann. This is Sports Center. Wait, check that. Not anymore. This is Countdown with Keith Olbermann. In sports, Dateline Nashville, Tennessee, and Dateline Salt Lake City, Utah. Congratulations, Nashville. 
Congratulations, Salt Lake City. You're getting Major League Baseball expansion franchises. There is a catch. This will happen sometime around the year 2032. That is the conclusion of my former ESPN colleague, Jeff Passan, pointing out that it has already passed a quarter century since the last baseball expansion clubs took the field back in 1998. And once the game started to expand in 1961, after 60 years of stasis, baseball had never gone more than 16 years without selling absolutely nothing of value for as much money as possible and adding at least two more deadbeat franchises to the bottom of the pile. It hasn't been much a topic of conversation, one owner anonymously told Passan, even though the expansion fee that the other owners would share would probably be about $4 billion per team. Well, why isn't it a topic of conversation? Because baseball realizes, even if the fans don't yet, that there is going to be a huge economic shakeout after the failure of the company that had most of the local TV rights to the current teams. The money growth is going to stop, at least temporarily. Plus, there is this unresolved mess about the Oakland, maybe Las Vegas, maybe Sacramento, maybe they stay in Oakland A's. Anyway, Jeff Passan at ESPN says Nashville and Salt Lake City are now co-favorites for expansion, and there is some news in that it had been thought for decades that if the game ever expanded to the West Coast, the new franchise would go to Portland, Oregon, not the other one. He says Salt Lake has now leapfrogged Portland. Of course, neither may wind up with that expansion franchise, neither Portland nor Salt Lake. The last time the A's moved to Oakland in 1968... The only way baseball avoided losing its unique antitrust exemption was to immediately grant a replacement expansion franchise to Kansas City. So the next baseball expansion could be to Oakland. (laughs) Dateline East, Brookfield, Massachusetts. One of the countless great character actors in perhaps the greatest of all sports comedy movies has died. Paul D'Amato played Captain Hook, player coach Tim McCracken of the Bad Guys, the Syracuse Bulldogs, in the utterly politically incorrect hockey movie Slapshot, starring Paul Newman. He passed away at home on Monday after a long fight against a neurological disease. D'Amato also played a Green Beret in The Deer Hunter. He was in Heaven's Gate and Suspect. And as he liked to joke, quote, I'm probably the only actor that ever beat up Paul Newman, almost beat up Robert De Niro, and held a knife to the throat of Cher. Everyone who knew him said Paul D'Amato was as nice a man as they ever made. Tell him about a charity for kids and he'd show up in his Syracuse uniform from the movie, carrying another Syracuse uniform auctioned off for charity. But he looked so wild, his big eyes flaring, his hair flying outwards, that how he appeared in Slapshot had served as the basis for the comic book and film character Wolverine. Paul D'Amato was 75 years old, so one last time for those of you who know your Slapshot. of us on this all new edition of countdown let's take one show from this month to remember the man who broke baseball's color line william edward white of the 1879 providence grays of the national league no it wasn't jackie robinson i'll explain this not so glorious history in things i promised not to tell First, yes, the daily roundup of the miscreants, morons, and Dunning-Kruger effect specimens who constitute today's worst persons in the world. The bronze, worse, Alex Andrade, Florida State Representative from Pensacola, Republican, sponsor of HB 757, 
another right-wing nut job bill. This is a media accountability law that would allow people to sue news organizations and require judges to presume that any anonymous source is lying and is automatically guilty of malice. And it would require a, quote, veracity hearing about any story anybody wanted to sue over. You'd have to have a hearing where a judge would decide if the story was true or false within 60 days of the filing of the lawsuit. Cool, says local Florida talk show host Trey Radel. Signing this into law will destroy conservative media in this state. He adds, while certain Republicans may think they're going to be suing and taking on the New York Times and the Washington Post, here's the breaking news. Liberal trial lawyers are going to have a field day with center-right media in the state of Florida. This Riddell guy, he too is a conservative radio host. This Republican state legislator is backing a gun bill that is pointed at his own side. Good work, Sparky. The runner-up worser, Senator Mike Lee of Utah. You know him. There are more evil Republicans. There are more vicious Republicans. But there probably are not dumber Republicans. Mike Lee is honked off at reports and the widespread conclusion in Washington that the impeachment of Homeland Security Secretary Mayorkas will never have a trial in the Senate because Senate Republicans are way less dumb than House Republicans are. Well, except Mike. Mike Lee has written Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell to insist that the impeachment not be tabled and that there be a trial. And there must be one. There must be one. There must be one. And all his Republican colleagues are in favor of it. And and look at all the signatures on his letter. And there are 13 signatures. He only got 13 other senators to sign his letter. And there are 11 blank spots on the letter. How pathetic. Worse yet... On the letter, the signatures of Senator Blackburn, Senator Ron Johnson, Senator Braun, and Senator Roger 911 Marshall, they are clearly all in the same handwriting. Oops. But our winner, Elon Musk. While Putin is now prosecuting Alexei Navalny's brother, and Putin has promoted the head of the prison service, who clearly helped to kill Navalny, Twitter X got hold of the new account established, I think, just Sunday or Monday by his widow. And right after Yulia Navalnaya reposted her video saying Putin had killed her husband, Twitter X, under Musk, suspended the account. Suspended Navalny's widow's account. Of course it did. After an international outcry, somebody managed to talk Elmo down from his shroom high or whatever he was on that he will eventually OD on. And Twitter issued this statement. Our platform's defense mechanism against manipulation and spam mistakenly flagged the account as violating our rules. We unsuspended the account as soon as we became aware of the error and will be updating the defense, unquote. (laughs) Elon Musk's platform defense mechanism against manipulation and spam is a guy named Cat Turd. Elon, I am owned by Vladimir Putin. Musk, ovite. Two days. Worst person in the world! Finally to the number one story on the countdown, and before we reach the end of Black History Month, I wanted to salute the fact that in sports, Black History Month begins and ends with the men who integrated Major League Baseball, William Edward White and Fleet Walker. No, not Jackie Robinson. William Edward White and Fleet Walker. This is in no way to diminish in the least what Jackie Robinson did. His success on the field and off, especially in 1947, not only reshaped American sports, it reshaped America. If he had failed, if he had hit 197 that first year instead of what he did hit, 297, all of the mindless prejudices and cliches of the segregated country we were would have been reinforced, integration would have been deferred or defeated, And Lord only knows what kind of blighted society might already exist here and not just threaten us. 
but Jackie Robinson did not break the baseball color line. In the winter of 1883-84, the minor league team in Toledo, Ohio, moved intact into the American Association, which was then the other major league, the lesser rival to the National League in baseball. Toledo's starting catcher was a former Oberlin and University of Michigan star named Moses Fleetwood Walker, and he was an African-American. On opening day of the American Association season, May 1st, 1884, he broke the color line. Toledo started its season on the road, on the road in, in Louisville, Kentucky. The baseball color line, as we have understood it historically, was broken 19 years and 21 days after the Civil War effectively ended, and it was broken in Kentucky. Indeed, the America and the American Association of 1884, in which Fleet Walker and later in the season his brother Welday Walker survived unimaginable hatred and abuse, had 11 other teams besides Toledo and Louisville in it. Among them in the American Association, Richmond, the capital of the Confederate States of America, also Baltimore, which nearly sided with the South in the Civil War, and Washington, a collectively mixed message, and Cincinnati, then an utterly southern city, and St. Louis. It is amazing that the Walker brothers survived and thrived. Fleet Walker batted 268, well above the league average for that 1884 season, and even one of the fiercest racists on the team, his own pitcher, Tony Mullane, said Walker was the best catcher he'd ever played with. The Toledo team dropped out of the American Association that winter, Walker continued to play in the minors, working towards another shot at the big leagues until 1889, and that is when baseball unofficially brought down the color barrier that Jackie Robinson would eventually break through. We celebrate Jackie Robinson, and we all but forget Fleet Walker. He's not even in the Baseball Hall of Fame, nor is there some kind of plaque somewhere saying he was Major League Baseball's first African-American player. Of course, in part, that's because Fleet Walker also wasn't actually Major League Baseball's first African-American player. The distinction, in fact, belongs to a man who never claimed it, who did everything possible, it appears, to hide and deny it. On the 20th of June, 1879, Joe Start the first baseman of what was then one of the National League's top teams, the Providence Grays, Providence, Rhode Island, broke his finger. There were no 25-man rosters or 26-man rosters and no farm teams from which to call anybody up in 1879. So the 1879 Providence Grays did what many clubs before 1920 did when they needed an extra player. They signed a kid off the streets, or in this case, they signed a kid off the campus of Brown University. And his name was William Edward White. He was 18 years old. We think they called him Bill, but nobody's certain. And on June 21st, 1879, he stepped across the foul lines at the Messer Street grounds in Providence, and he broke baseball's color barrier. And nobody really knew it for 125 years. That's when irrefutable evidence was unearthed that William White's father was the president of a railroad in Georgia, and his mother was one of the slaves he owned. She herself was of mixed heritage. William White was evidently light-skinned, Caucasian-featured, and spent his life in the old, now unused and heartbreaking term, passing. His college thought he was white. His wife thought he was white. His census takers thought he was white. When he died in 1937, the death certificate listed him as white. Deep down, he may have considered himself white, and thus, since race is a non-scientific concept, he was white, whatever that means. Or he may have just chosen to enthusiastically embrace the opportunity to avoid the hell that was living in America for blacks of the 19th century, and for most of the 20th, and now sadly much of the 21st. We don't know his motives. We don't know, also, if he only played that one day in the National League, 
because somebody suspected he was of mixed heritage. It's just as easy to think that he was a one-day emergency replacement. And the Providence Grays had three games until the next game after that, and they rearranged their lineup, and they just dropped him, as dozens of other teams did to dozens of other one- or two-day big leaguers, literally for the next 40 years. We do know there is no evidence that he ever proclaimed himself to be an African-American, nor that the team had any idea, nor that he ever acknowledged his accomplishment. That fact that White clearly did not self-identify as black leads many to the interpretation that White was not the first African-American in baseball because, at least passively, he was insisting he was not black. Regardless, there were at least three African-Americans in the major leagues before Jackie Robinson in 1947. Oh, and there was nearly a fourth. Charlie Grant, a top second baseman from the early Negro Leagues, whom John McGraw, the manager, had at spring training with the 1901 Baltimore Orioles. McGraw said he was a Native American called Tokahoma. When people saw how well Tokahoma played, they knew he was in fact Charlie Grant. There was also nearly a fourth in 1905. The newspaper The Boston Traveler reported in midseason that the team that would become the Braves was fed up with its lousy second baseman and was about to sign the top collegiate player in the country, Matty Matthews of Harvard, a black man. It did not happen. It was 1905. Matthews instead signed with a minor league team in Vermont. There was nearly another fourth in 1916. The Oakland Oaks of the Pacific Coast League signed a top local amateur player named Jimmy Claxton. They believed he was a Native American. He was and also an African-American. And he was released five days later when they found that last part out. Ironically, that was not before a local candy company rushed out a baseball card of him. There is a Jimmy Claxton 1916 baseball card. Jimmy Claxton, William Clarence Matty Matthews, Charlie Grant, Fleet Walker, Wellday Walker, William Edward White, buried by history, even during Black History Month. And why? Well, I think because we like our history, especially our social history, to have struggles and pitfalls and even danger, provided it has a happy ending. And can you have heard these stories and say that Claxton or Matthews or Grant or the Walkers had any kind of happy ending? Or William White? William White was born in 1860, before the Civil War. Thus, since his mother was a slave, and and not by the laws of the Confederacy, but by the laws in force at the time in the United States of America, thus by those laws, the man who actually became the first African-American in professional team sports in this country 69 years before Jackie Robinson was a man who was born a slave and spent his life in a segregated racist society, passing as white, never acknowledging his place in history. And exactly what is happy about that. I've done all the damage I can do here. Thank you for listening. Countdown musical directors Brian Ray and John Philip Chanel arranged, produced, and performed most of our music. Mr. Ray was on the guitars, bass, and drums. Mr. Chanel handled orchestration and keyboards, and it was produced by TKO Brothers. Other music, including some of the Beethoven compositions, arranged and performed by No Horns Allowed. The sports music is the Olderman theme from ESPN2, written by Mitch Warren Davis, courtesy of ESPN Inc., Our satirical and pithy musical comments are by my accompanist, company in in company, by Nancy Faust, the best baseball stadium organist ever. And our announcer today was my friend Richard Lewis. Everything else was pretty much my fault. That's Countdown for this, the 259th day until the 2024 U.S. presidential election, the 1,140th day since Dementia J. Trump's first attempted coup against the democratically elected government of the United States. Use the 14th Amendment, the Insurrection Act, the justice system, the mental health system to stop him from doing it again and swear about it on CNN 
while we still can. The next scheduled countdown is tomorrow. Bulletins as the news warrants. Till then, I'm Keith Olbermann. Good morning, good afternoon, good night, and good luck. The crazy shit that Trump says. Someday, watching CNN, I will feel a glow just thinking of you. And the crazy shit Trump says tonight. Thank you, Nancy Faust.